you. Welcome, Howard. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank it's, you, Dan. Yeah. Um, that was a great start to this evening, you know, because a lot of what your book is about and your leadership is about is values, and that was a really Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Yeah. Thank you. We have a lot to try to pack into the next mm -hmm. hour and 15 minutes, and so conceptually what I would like to do is spend a fair amount of time on what the introduction touched on, and that is the way you grew up and the imprint that a lot of that had on how you um, chose to run your own company. I'd like then to get to some of the values that you discuss in the book as to the social responsibility of companies and so forth. And then there's one other thing maybe we can get to, <laughs> which is your uh, consideration of the running for president. But let's build up to that, because that needs the foundation okay. to be understood. So, um, and then of course I have audience questions. Uh, so let's start with, uh, if, in your own words, the, the circumstances in which your first 15 or 17 years sure. occurred. Well, thank you. Uh, thank Lisa Pritzker and John Pritzker for having me uh, for the JCC and for my good friend Dan for that warm welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, well, as Dan mentioned, uh, I grew up in the uh, Brooklyn housing projects of Canarsie. And um, there can't be someone from Canarsie here. Yeah. Over <laughs> here. Yeah. Well, then you're going to know this story very well. Yeah. Um, my, my parents, uh, my father came back from World War II and uh, did not take advantage of the GI Bill. And I had a series of uh, blue collar jobs. and. Uh, there was an incident when I was seven years old where uh, this particular job that he had at the time, he was a truck driver delivering and picking up cloth diapers before the invention of Pampers. And uh, he fell on a sheet of ice in 1960 and a, as a blue collar worker was dismissed, uh, no uh, hospitalization, no workman's compensation. And uh, with a period of days and weeks that followed, uh, I witnessed literally the fracturing of a family. Uh, in fact, probably about once every two weeks, Jewish Family Services would drop off food uh, because we were just out of luck. Uh, that experience imprinted me with a great deal of shame, uh, insecurity, uh, and it led to a significant level of, of financial pressure and, as I write about in the book, dysfunction. The first chapter of the book, I think people are just shocked to read something that almost is hard to understand or believe. My grandmother, my mother's mother, uh, was a professional gambler and, um, and very good at it. Uh, and she held uh, card games in her home uh, with a array of characters. And she was the uh, host of the game uh, she was the loaner of money with a very high interest rate. Uh, she took a uh, piece from every, uh, every, ga every game, and she served food, and she had a chauffeur. And that was her business. Um, I came home one day at the age of 10, and in my two-bedroom small apartment in the projects, uh, I was witnessing the furniture being rearranged. And my mother said to me, uh, that tonight you need to, we're gonna have an early dinner and you need to go to your room and just stay there the rest of the night. And for the next four years, about three nights a week, my grandmother's game shifted to my two bedroom apartment in the projects. And it shifted there because uh, my parents were getting paid to host a game in the house. My mother was the waitress and my father was the chauffeur. For three, four years of being in that room at night uh, and listening to the abuse that my mother was getting from these people and my grandmother uh, was another kind of three, four years of imprinting of a very tough, dysfunctional environment. 
And I began to uh, take on a life of my own by hiding in a stairwell uh, to get away from the trauma. And there was a lot of it. Now, uh, my father was a person who was in many ways a, uh, a victim of both a system that did not respect the dignity of his work, but he also did not take on the personal responsibility to better himself. And uh, uh, he had a lot of rage. I think also, I don't, never knew what happened in World War II when he was stationed at the South Pacific. I think he came back damaged, he had yellow fever, uh, but he was, he was dark. My mother, on the other hand, uh, if my father was the darkness, my mother was the light. And uh, this one quick experience, and then we can move on, I'm sorry. No. Um, so when I grew up, there was no public library. Uh, so, but there was something interesting, which was a bookmobile. And the bookmobile would show up every Wednesday afternoon, and my mother would take me by the hand and pick me up at school, we'd walk over to the bookmobile, we'd get a book, uh, we'd read the book during the week and take it back. And this went on for quite a while. Uh, well, one Wednesday or Thursday, uh, we, I thought we were going to the bookmobile, but we got on a bus. And uh, I don't know where we were going, and the bus ride was about 20 minutes, and then we walked what seemed like a few miles, and we get to a large, large gathering, rally, of uh, hundreds and hundreds of people. I had no idea where we were or what we were doing, and my mother was just gripping my hand, and all of a sudden, uh, we heard a voice, and the voice was a young senator from Massachusetts who was running for president, hmm. campaigning in Brooklyn, New York. And I, I tell that story in the book because I looked at my mother and uh, she was just glowing and she was gripping my hand and the glow on her face was the relationship that my mother somehow developed in believing that everything that John F. Kennedy said, he was speaking to her. And what she got from that was the belief that our station in life did not define who I was gonna be. And from the time that I can remember, my mother demanded that I was gonna go to college, we were gonna figure this thing out. And it was really her relationship and her belief in the country as it relates to her belief in John F. Kennedy and what he was saying in many ways to the country. But, he, but my mother thought he was speaking directly to her. And so the odds of me getting from the projects in Brooklyn to here is in so many ways the gift and the promise of the country, uh, the belief that my mother had in America, and, uh, and the belief that now I have in trying to do everything I can to restore the faith and confidence in the leadership of the country, a government that works for us, and most importantly for millions of American families uh, making sure that we restore faith in the promise of the country and the American dream. And that is why I said on national TV on Sunday night that I'm seriously considering running for president, but we will get into why and how uh, as a centrist independent. Yeah. Great. Now, what that does is leaves us in suspense and how the um, sitting in, the, in that stairwell yes. fire escape and your mother's influence brought you to the enlightened leadership at Starbucks yes. that you put on there. So can you trace that for us? Well, in so many ways, the experiences that I had as a child and, and just the, two, the few episodes I just described, uh, it shaped me in a number of ways. One, um, I lived with a great deal of shame as a young boy. Um, and that shame was uh, steeped in the embarrassment of where we lived and kind of the facial expressions that I got when someone would say, where do you live, where do you come from? And you'd say Brooklyn and someone would say, well, where? And as soon as you said the projects, all of a sudden you could tell there was a different level of understanding and a lack of respect. Um, but the lack of dignity is what I experienced in terms of my parents. And uh, just not feel, they were never felt as if they were enough. And so when I was in a position to think about building Starbucks, I was really trying to build the kind of company my father never got a chance to work mm -hmm. for. And uh, what I tried to do from the very beginning was set out to build a different business model. 
And uh, that business model was to try and create the fragile balance between profit and shareholder value and conscience and responsibility. And so everything we've tried to do would be, in a sense, try and build a company that was performance driven through the lens of humanity. And all along, I think, I, I kept thinking about my mother and father who did not get a chance to see my success. Uh, and in a very uh, unique way, trying to make them proud of, of me and uh, trying to, in a sense, uh, pay it forward for what uh, I was given, which was the blessing of the country and the opportunity. And so when Dan mentioned earlier about uh, free college tuition and equity in the form of stock options and comprehensive health insurance, those were programs that were very difficult to convince a lot of people to do uh, but I believed all along that to build a great, enduring company, you got to define what your core purpose is and your reason for being. And our reason for being and core purpose was not only to make money and not only to drive the stock price, but to do it in a way in which success would be shared and to demonstrate to, to everyone in our company and to others that not every business decision should be an economic one. And, uh, the, the truth of what we've accomplished in so many ways is that Starbucks has succeeded uh, not because we did these things, uh, but we succeeded because we built a large reservoir of trust with our people based on the culture, the values, and guiding principles of the company, all kind of steeped in what I did not experience as a young boy and trying to do something that I thought needed to be done to provide the dignity of work to everybody regardless of their education, uh, where they came from, their sexual orientation, the color of their skin, their ethnic background, that everyone in a company should be valued. And that speaks now to the country. And everyone in the country should have access uh, to the opportunities uh, that the country can provide. And I think today, as we sit here, it's fair to say that millions of Americans do not believe that the American dream is there for them, and millions of American families believe that their children are not gonna have a better life than they do, and I, I wanna reject that uh, and say, I don't wanna embrace that as a operating principle, that uh, we can apply a level of innovation and imagination and do everything we can to kind of rebalance and kind of reset the economic structure in the country so the lack of equality uh, and the opportunity is for everyone. And the companies like such as yours, particularly those who are willing to be outspoken on political issues or issues of um, injustice in various forms, sometimes find a, a, a third rail there when they reach out and touch it. Uh, and your company, I'd like you to talk about it generally, and then we'll talk about the Philadelphia incident. It was particularly sensitive towards racial issues, yes. right? If you could elaborate on that, and then talk about what happened in Philadelphia. So I think for the last uh, maybe five, six years, uh, I've been asking uh, inside Starbucks a very important question, and then I asked it publicly of our shareholders, and that is, what is the role and responsibility of a public company today. And what I suggested to our board uh, and to our shareholders that I think the rules of engagement and responsibility for, for public company today have changed. And that we need to do more for our employees, more for the communities we serve. And uh, although I've been criticized for this many times, uh, that the responsibility of a company also is to elevate the national conversation, if you can, on issues of injustice. And so uh, in the last few years, as we witnessed a significant racial divide and racial injustice and African-American men being murdered, uh, I decided that we should talk about this as a company. And as we did, uh, many people in the company said, this is something you can't do. You can't have a national a town hall meeting in Seattle or anywhere in the, in the company, country and talk about race. And I, I said, why? why? Why can't we talk about race? And can't we have enough faith and confidence in each other that even if we're going to disagree, we, we, we should try? And so we did. And that led to about 12 national meetings around the, the country. In St. Louis, a young man who was 18 years old, tall African-American young man stood up and he said in front of his peers, I'm 18 years old. 
and I don't know if I'm going to make it to 19. And when I heard that, uh, I've always asked myself, if, if you are exposed to something and you ignore it, uh, then you kind of become part of the problem. And I, I didn't want to become a bystander. Uh, in Seattle, a young man stood up and said, you know, racism is like humidity. Uh, you can't see it, but you can feel it. And, um, and then we had people uh, speak about fact, the fact that they grew up in a family of, of where their uncle was a member of the KKK, and they thought the language that he used was language that everybody used. And we learned something that all of us Probably everyone in this room, whether we want to admit it or not, has some level of unconscious bias. And so that led me to a question, that at a time in America when there was so much division, is there anything we could do? So I had the brilliant, brilliant idea uh, that we should try and use the stores as a vehicle to communicate uh, our concern and elevate the national conversation. I said, why don't we write something on the cup? That seems like a good idea. Um, and um, there was a great discussion about it. And I said, well, I, I think it's going to be OK. It's going to be fine. And so we wrote Race Together on the Cup. And uh, it was my idea. And um, it turned out to be just a terrible level of execution and rejection on the, f on the part of customers and, in many ways, our people. But two things happened as a result of that. The first was that I got a call, and, and uh, uh, someone in a southern state said that uh, a white customer refused to be served by an African-American barista. And then we got another call and said, somebody just uh, put a bullet through one of our store windows. It turned out it wasn't a bullet. It was a ball bearing from a slingshot, but could have killed somebody. And so within 24 hours, we stopped it. And we realized that we had kind of crossed over the Rubicon, and this is not something we should do. Interestingly enough, if you did a survey today, five years later, and you said, or you said what are the things that you're most proud of that we've done over the last decade, most people at Starbucks would say, what I'm most proud of is that the company had the courage and conviction to try and have a national conversation about something that's wrong in the country. And I think in many ways, that has been my life story, uh, trying to reject the status quo and try and make things better, uh, try and have the curiosity to see around corners and try and fix things and, and have the imagination to think about things in a way that perhaps others don't. And if it doesn't work, uh, fail fast, realize you made a mistake, and, and move on. Uh, but the entire uh, foundation of Starbucks has been the ability uh, to build the kind of company that does have a core purpose and a reason for being and doing everything we can to make our people and our customers proud. And along the way, build shareholder value. And which makes me think that so probably everybody in this room would share this thought that we have a, like a built-in gauge in our life that gets turned on when we're aware of it. And one of our goals is to make the world just a little bit better, hope through our efforts and everybody else's efforts by the time we leave it. And you referred before to the um, fact that you see our government and our society somewhat dysfunctional right yeah. now, and one of your goals is to work on it. And I feel that. I feel like suddenly the gauge has started going in reverse, going backwards. And I, so I wonder, before we get to some of the specific issues, why do you think that happens? What, where did we kind of get off track as a society? I mean, it, it's not 50 years ago. It yeah. wasn't John Kennedy. You know, I wish I was you know, smart enough to answer that question with great specificity. Uh, I don't know when it exactly happened. Uh, I want to say that I think Donald Trump is the worst president in the history of our country mm -hmm. and needs to be fired uh, and, and represents so much that is wrong with American life and uh, has fractured the level of dignity and respect and the set of values and civility and all the things that we would hold the, the office mm -hmm. of the presidency to be. Uh, but Donald Trump is a symptom yeah. of a much bigger problem. Uh, and so when you have this level of inequity, 
mm -hmm. uh, in our society, uh, when people of color don't feel as if they're equal in America. Um, you know, I think when, when Martin Luther King, which we just celebrated uh, the holiday and his birthday, and, and Bobby Kennedy in 1968, uh, they were dealing with uh, things with regard to the racial divide and racism in 1968. And in many ways, I think we could all ask the question, uh, how much have we improved yeah. since 1968? And uh, certainly many people of color believe that we have not improved hardly enough or at all. And I think we're all responsible for uh, the kind of country that we're living in right now. And the question I've been asking is, what kind of country do we want to live in for our, for our children and our grandchildren? Yeah. I don't know when we went wrong, but I think, uh, certainly I think we all can agree that something is seriously wrong. Uh, that, and whether you're a Democrat or Republican, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter, we're all Americans and things don't feel right. And I, my concern has been this feeling like we are all becoming desensitized as if this is normal and it's not normal. And my fear is if we keep going like this, not only for another two years, but God forbid this person and this administration has another four years, yeah. I don't think the American people uh, can withstand this level of hate and fear and vitriol. And I also feel, as I've traveled the country, that the American people are so much better than our political class and deserve so much better. And I've traveled the country and I've seen ordinary Americans doing extraordinary things, and it's so heartwarming to me. Uh, and I just feel like we've got to raise them up and give people a sense of hope again. And unfortunately, many people have lost faith right. in the country. And I think one of the primary reasons for that is that people do not trust leadership, and the government on both sides of the aisle are, is not working uh, for the American people. And I think the, the issue that, that I think I'm focused on right now is someone asked me, when was the last time you thought the government was working? And I, I was really kind of uh, stumbling around to kind of think, okay, this is a really important question. When was that? Yeah. And I, somehow I went back to 1986. And I went back to 86 because I remember Tip O'Neill mm -hmm. and Ronald Reagan, two people, completely different ideology, two different parties, but putting the American people in the room mm -hmm. and working together on behalf of the American people. That was, that was my answer, 1986. And if my answer is 86 and you disagree with that, then okay, when was there a time before, mm -hmm. like in the 90s or <laughs> when, when was it? And um, right now, uh, I think we're living in a situation where we have a president that is not qualified to be president. But in addition to that, uh, we have a two-party system that is literally broken, that is dysfunctional, that is so polarized in, and engaged in revenge politics every single day. And someone asked me, well, when did that start? And so I said, well, uh, I'm not an historian, but President Obama and President Bush, a Democrat and Republican president, both submitted legislation to the opposition of Congress at the time on transformational, comprehensive immigration reform. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, the oppositional party would not give the respective president at the time the political victory. And here we are, many, many years later, the government shuts down, and we can't get anything close to a compromise when 79% of the American people, just recently polled, says we want comprehensive, responsible, sensible immigration reform. So if the majority of the country that is being represented by people in Washington are telling our elected officials we want comprehensive immigration reform, why aren't we getting it? 
And the answer is because the two parties are steeped in their own ideology and their own self-interest and their own self-preservation and are unwilling to come together. And the parties on both extremes are leading the country in a way that is not representative of the silent majority of Americans that don't have a voice because of the two far extremes, which is the progressive left of the Democratic Party and the far rigid right of the Republican Party. And the question that I'm asking that has gotten so much uh, interest, most of it negative, uh, is can't we do better? And isn't it a expression of democracy to ask the American people that perhaps there's a better choice or a choice that you should, you should have? Why does it have to be two parties running for president? And whether or not you agree as a Democrat or Republican, isn't it an expression of democracy to give the American people a, a different choice? So let's... Yeah. So let's go to that question. Okay. You have told the public that you're considering. Yes. Uh, what is your thought process? Okay. So this is, I think, uh, uh, of all the things that I'm going to say tonight, uh, I think this is the most important takeaway. Uh, Howard Schultz is not going to be a spoiler, and I'm not going to do anything to reelect Donald Trump. <laughs> Now, if you would allow me to state my theory of the case uh, as to why somebody who has been a Democrat uh, all of a sudden believes that if I were to run for president, I would leave the Democratic Party. So first and foremost, I have great respect for the people on both sides of the aisle, uh, but I no longer see myself uh, as a Democrat. I, I cannot embrace the far left liberal policies that I think are false promises in terms of a $40 trillion bill on free Medicare for all, free college for all, and a government job, which adds up to about $40 trillion. And the country is sitting right now with about $21.5 trillion of debt. It, it's just not going to happen. Now, having said that, I've come to the conclusion that certain things exist right now that provide a compelling case and an opportunity, even though I recognize that this is a very stiff, tough climb that has never been done before, but it's un-American to say it can't be done or it shouldn't be tried. Now, 42% of the American people who are registered to vote affiliate themselves as an independent. 30% are registered as an independent, and 12% say, I affiliate myself with either party, but as an independent. But those 42% of the American people have not had a legitimate choice. I also believe that if there is a choice between reelecting Donald Trump or a far left leaning progressive Democrat, that the Republicans, most of whom do not respect and don't like Donald Trump, will not pull a lever for that democratic liberal person who represents socialism to them. They will reelect Donald Trump. Having said that, my own research and the polling that we've done strongly suggests that those millions of Republicans who do not respect and don't like Donald Trump, if they have a alternative of a centrist independent who's willing to work with both parties and take the ideas of both parties in a centrist way, will come to a conclusion that there is a better choice. And I think the, the false narrative that unfortunately has existed in the last week or so, that if I were to pursue this, that I'm going to spoil the election and siphon off all these Democratic uh, votes, uh, I don't think is as true as the facts. But regardless of that, I will make a final decision about whether or not to run for president as an independent in late spring, early summer. And if the numbers for me 
don't add up to a compelling case, then I would not proceed. But as I sit here today, I, my conviction and my courage and my love of the country puts me in a position where I want to go out to the American people over the next two, three months, like I am here tonight. I want to listen, I want to learn, and I want to see if I can ignite a national movement to kind of restructure, reimagine, and disrupt this political system that is based not on the will of the people, but the will of the ideology of both parties. You cited um, health care, the Democrats' position on health care, and it gets characterized different ways depending on who's yeah. articulating it, as one of the differentiating uh, principles between you and the Democratic Party. What would be your idea for a national health care system that works? Yeah. Um, well, like, like many issues, the national debt, the health care issue, our broken education system, um, the immigration problem that we have. Th these are complex problems uh, that did not develop overnight, and they've been with us for a long time. And one of the issues is that both parties have continued to kind of sweep these things under the rug and not address them. And, and in doing so, the problems have gotten larger and more complex and harder to solve. So, I'm going, to, I'm going to answer the question, but as a preface, I'm not an expert on health care. And what I would do, in addition to what I'm going to respond to, is I would surround myself with the best and brightest health care professionals who could help me understand how to solve this problem. And just remember, of all the issues facing the American people, all the problems, the health care issue has been central to my life. And Starbucks was one of the first and only companies to provide comprehensive health insurance to part-time people. And we did it while growing our company very successfully. So I know a little bit about this in terms of trying to integrate this into a company's philosophy. So first and foremost, the Affordable Care Act, I believe, was the right thing to do. And it gave almost 30 million people coverage that didn't have it. So I'm all for what President Obama achieved. Having said that, in the last few years, we've seen significant rise in premiums. And families across the country are really only a health crisis away from bankruptcy. And just as a fact, about 45% of American families today don't have $400 in the bank and are just a crisis of any kind away from a real, a real bank, real personal bankruptcy. So we have to go back into the Affordable Care Act, and we have to fix what's wrong. And the first thing we have to do is kind of crack the code on how do we reduce the premiums on American families. And the answer to that is complicated, but not impossible. So both parties are complicit. And I know Democrats in the House are not going to like this, but I want to try and speak the truth. Both parties are complicit, having made a deal with the devil. And the devil, with regard to the health care crisis, is the way in which the pharmaceutical companies have lobbied inside Washington with a level of, of self-interest that basically controls how people vote. So the pharmaceutical companies and the government today, the government has no way to negotiate with the pharmaceutical companies to get transparency and to lower the cost of, of drugs for the American people. And the reason for that is the lobbying efforts of these companies. So the leader of the country, and what we're really talking about tonight in many ways, is leadership. Leadership that the country can trust, leadership that puts the American people first, and leadership that will remove the self-interest of these companies and make sure that the government is working for us. So trying to fix this problem in lowering the premiums is we must bring pharmaceutical companies to the table in a way that they are not and have not been for years. The third piece is corporate America, a lot of people aren't going to like this, uh, is I think there is 
a crisis of capitalism in, in the country. And the crisis of capitalism uh, and a great proxy for that was President Trump giving corporate America a reduction of from 35 to 21 percent in a corporate tax rate. Now, I'm a, I was a sitting CEO at the time, and I rejected that, and I was on national TV saying, this is an immoral decision when the opportunity that he had with regard to lowering taxes was comprehensive tax reform to try and give relief to the people who need it most, but providing corporate America with a 21% 21, 21 tax rate was irresponsible. We have to bring corporate America to the table. We can't mandate to them what they should do, but we should incent them to understand that they have a moral responsibility to take care of their people in ways that offsets the cost of health care on the backs of the government. And so at a minimum, you've got corporate America, you've got the United States government, and you've got the pharmaceutical industry coming together with the best minds in the world to figure this thing out. Now, this is a complex problem, but I am so confident that if you remove the ideology and the self-interest out of the room, this is a problem that can be fixed. I would also say that telling the American people that we are going to have health care free, government paid for everyone, is a $32 trillion bill in 10 years. And although it's a wonderful thing to say, it's not a realistic thing to execute. And we, we don't have that kind of money. And so there has to be a different approach to the problem, and it has to be multifaceted, and people have to have skin in the game that they don't have today. But the core issue of why the problem is so big and has been so difficult to solve is because it has not been in the interest of both parties to solve it. And the answer is not just a free government program, because, ladies and gentlemen, nothing is free. Nothing is free. So I want to go to audience questions, but in listening to you, I, I, I hear this tremendously rational, persuasive, and thought, well thought through discussion of our concern generally, whatever your political spectrum is, that things aren't working. I'd like to just step outside okay. and have you look in, and what I saw in the last week was you not having an opportunity to say these things, mm. right? You, you were very quickly uh, stereotyped, you know, billionaire wants to have a narcissistic, well, et cetera, right? There were a lot of different reasons. But what I want to, my question is, why do you think there was such a blowback to your candidacy? And, I mean, it's not yeah. even a candidacy, it's a consideration. Um, well, my, my wife and I were flying back uh, from Arizona where I gave a talk the other night, and she was reading some of the things on the web, and I, I, I said, you gotta just shut that, you gotta stop that. <laughs> you know, why, why are you reading that? Uh, did, did you, and she said, did you see what they just said about you? <laughs> they don't even know you, you know? So. One thing that has really troubled me about this week uh, is uh, I was labeled with this moniker of being an out-of-touch billionaire. Um, and uh, why, why I was so troubled by that is, uh, what is the American dream? I am, I'm living proof, and I'm so proud that I have lived the American dream. I came from nothing and I arrived on this stage and the odds of me getting from there to here, I'm telling you, are virtually impossible but can only happen in America. This is the only place it could happen. Right. And, and yet, and, and yet I, I'm gonna be criticized and punished for being successful. And if they kind of look under the covers, I've built the kind of company that has treated people extremely well because I believe that success is best when it's shared. So no one in America should be criticized for being successful 
especially if you're self-made. And we shouldn't get to a place where there are people yelling from the rafters that because you have been successful, you are a bad person and we're gonna be punitive to you. That's, that's to me, the antithesis of the spirit of the country. So the short answer to your question is, I, I think I have surprised people in what I said. I think the, the, the vitriolic response has come primarily from the Democratic Party, uh, who has falsely accused me of uh, being a, uh, not a patriot. And I, I, I want to repeat what I said. I'm, nobody wants to see Donald Trump fired more than me. I'm not going to do one thing to get him reelected, and I'm going to do everything I can to make the country better. Uh, I don't know why, uh, when I say these things, that I would be uh, held to a standard in which uh, people want to ostracize me and, and uh, uh, put me in a position where what I say and what I feel and my love of the country should be criticized at the level it has. But it, I'm unfazed by it, I'm undeterred by it, and I'm going to keep doing what I believe is right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So let's go to a our audience questions. Sure. This ties uh, very well. And with Washington being incredibly partisan these days, as you discussed, how do you envision actually being a president with no party affiliation and running a dogs and cats Congress? Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't in the question. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, how do we think things are working right now? I mean, uh, I, I have to answer the question first by stating uh, the current situation to me, uh, I don't know if it could get any worse, I guess it can, uh, but just on the heels of the government shutdown uh, and what we've been witnessing, it seems, like I think we could all agree that the dysfunction and polarization is at a very high level. Can, can we all agree to that? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, is there any reason to believe that if a Democrat did win the presidency in 2020, that all of a sudden Republicans and Democrats would say, well, now we have a Democratic president, uh, we're, now we're going to get along, and we're going to do everything we can for the American people? I, don't, I just don't think so. Uh, so the short answer to your question is the following. And it takes a little imagination, and so I ask you to kind of dream with me a little bit. Um, can we imagine a situation where the American people come together and ignite around a new path? And they send a very, very powerful message to the United States Congress, a message that has not existed since George Washington. And that is, we are fed up and disgusted and exhausted uh, with the dysfunction and the two parties not working for us, and we're going to elect an independent person to be the President of the United States. And if that took place, I believe that the, this independent person would have as close to a mandate as possible to bring these people together. Now, what I'm going to be saying and what I believe is that I do believe that there are good ideas on both sides of the aisle. I do believe that there are good people on both sides of the aisle, and I will welcome all of these ideas in a way that is not based on ideology. Uh, at Starbucks for the last 36 years, uh, every Monday at our leadership meeting, I've had two empty chairs in a room. And in every board meeting, I've had two empty chairs. And those two empty chairs was a metaphor for a customer and a Starbucks employee, who we call a partner. And every decision, every conversation was based in my mind on whether or not we were making that decision in a way that would make our customers and our people proud. And what I can promise you is if I do proceed, and if I'm fortunate enough to be elected president, I will have a chair in the Oval Office and in every room that I'm in, thinking about every minute of the day about the American people and doing everything I can, as I did at Starbucks, to make the American people proud. And the American people today are not proud of the decisions this government is making, and obviously not proud of the lack of dignity, the lack of respect, and the lack of leadership coming from this president.
Uh, just as an aside, it would be interesting to see the Supreme Court depoliticized by an independent president appointing somebody based on their views and not their politics. Um, okay, so people would like you to talk about the history of uh, from Jill Stein back through Ralph Nader and uh, so forth. And, and how you do the calculations around the electoral college effects yeah. versus sure. the net popular right. vote. Okay. In the last almost 40 years, if you go back and you study uh, how each president has been elected uh, and how they got to 270, uh, what you'll see is a common thread that in every case, eight to 10 states, battleground states, decided the election. And so what that means to me is that if you live in a red state and you happen to be a Democrat, your vote doesn't matter. And if you live in a blue state and you're Republican, your vote doesn't matter. So because of gerrymandering and the way the electorate currently works, eight to 10 states decide the presidential election. And that will be the case in 2020 if there's two parties. Now, the work that we've done uh, in this past year is I can unequivocally share with you that if we proceed to run for president, we have done the work and we, would, we will be on the ballot of every state, all 50 states, in every county, in every district. That work has been done. Now, what that means is that if I run for president for the first time, in many, many years, all 50 states, not eight to 10, because it'll be a three-person race, will decide the election. And for the first time in 40 years, every vote and every voice will matter. And that, to me, just think about that as a proxy, whether you like me or not, and whether you think a third party is the right thing to do as a proxy for our democracy, shouldn't every state and every vote matter? And if you look back, it's eight to 10 states every single time deciding the election. That, to me, needs to be changed. Yeah. And, and, and as a result of that, the math works uh, that I could get to 270 if you take the 42% and you assume that you're going to get votes uh, from both parties because both parties are gonna have a very difficult time with mainstream Democrats pulling the lever if there's another choice for a liberal Democrat and millions more Republicans do not want to elect, reelect Donald Trump. So our next question, the writer would like to get your views on climate change. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we have such evidence and such science uh, suggesting that the planet is burning up uh, and we have a rejection from this president administration and the Republican Party that it doesn't matter. Uh, that along with uh, the president removing the United States from the Paris Climate Accord uh, was a mistake. So if I was fortunate enough to be president, uh, we must as a responsible society recognize that we must work with every other nation uh, to do everything humanly possible to reverse what is happening. And I can tell you in my own business, in the last 10 years, the entire coffee industry has been affected by something called rust, uh, which is basically a result of a disease on coffee plants as a result of a lack of rainfall. And so I've traveled in many of these countries and seen it firsthand. So we must address this. Time is an enemy. We're on a collision course with time, and it is irresponsible of this administration to ignore just basic science, let alone uh, leave the Paris Climate Accord and just say we're not gonna be engaged in this. A very, very bad mistake. Yeah. If I could tag on to that, that's really part of a bigger issue, which is since World War II, we've essentially based our foreign policy on multilateralism. Mm -hmm. 
And it seems as though our government is moving more towards a bilateral theory, including the tariff uh, wars and yeah. other examples, NATO. Yeah. Pick up on that. Okay. I'm thinking of the, probably the issue that comes to mind first and foremost is the president's recent decision uh, to pull our troops out of Syria. Uh, again, a very significant strategic mistake that is not in the national interest of the United States. So why? So first off, uh, Syria has been a proxy war for the Saudis and the Iranians, as well as a civil war inside the country. And we've had the Kurds fighting alongside U.S. troops, trying to do everything possible to keep that country afloat. We pull out of Syria, and he does it in a way that is just, to me, unimaginable. First off, he does not communicate this with the allies we have in the region, specifically Jordan and Israel. Secondarily, he doesn't have the humility to listen to his advisors, primarily Secretary Mattis, to understand the downside cause and effect of leaving. And the downside cause and effect are so serious. And what's so serious is by leaving, he now provides Russia and Iran, and Iran a stronghold in the region where Russia will now have an opportunity to have great influence and we will not know the consequences of this for years. And so what this president has done in less than two years is fractured relationships with our allies that are longstanding and broken the trust and confidence that these countries have to have for America's leadership in the world. And so uh, what he's done within the EU, what he's done with NATO, uh, the trade war in China, to me, is just, an, uh, again, uh, for someone who has done business in China for 20 years and has, and has traveled to China perhaps more than any other CEO over the last 10 years, uh, there is no strategic intent that I can understand that is going to get us what we need with regard to China. The, their manipulation of their currency and the trade issues and the trade imbalance is real. I get that. But the result is... Uh, we now have a consumer tax in America as a result of goods and services going up. Uh, but if you're a farmer in Iowa and you're in the agricultural business, you have now lost significant markets that are not going to come back for years. And the issue about China is China is not an enemy of the United States. China is a fierce competitor that wants to displace us as the economic power in the world. And if we go out 10 years from today, the way we are currently going it's probably going to happen, which means that we need the kind of leadership in the White House and leadership among the government leaders to understand what we need to do. We need to cooperate with China specifically on two primary issues. The first one is just the security of America, which is we need China to help us co-author a strategic way to deal with North Korea. And right now, the trade war and the issues that are going on China has abdicated themselves from that situation. That is a net negative for the United States, something that's not really being talked about. The second thing is, going back to your earlier question about global warming and what's happening with the, the planet you know, burning up, is we need China and the United States to lead a co-authored long-term strategy and bring other nations in to attack this problem. But while this is all going on, China is investing billions of dollars in One Belt Road, which is a super, super infrastructure development throughout Asia Pacific, because they recognize that President Trump made another major mistake in removing us from TPP, which is the trade, uh, uh, gr trade treaty within that entire region. And so we got ourselves out of that, and then China inserted themselves as the major player in all of these trade deals that are now going on that is going to create economic development for China and nothing for us is a significant level of a problem that we're going to be dealing with for years to come when we need economic growth beyond 3 to 4% in America, which speaks to the national debt. And the $21 trillion debt, which will be closer to $25 trillion when Trump leaves office, 
is we've got to get economic growth beyond three to four percent. Uh, and the only way that we're going to do that is to, tr is to elevate job creation, innovation, the magnetism of America, free trade, that is fair trade, I understand all that, but China, to remove China from this equation is a big strategic mistake for the United States, and President Trump has played this all wrong. So are you ready for the tough question of the night? Now that you've warmed up? <laughs> Tell us about your love of baseball. Oh, God. <laughs> You know, uh, we were backstage, and I didn't know that Roy was involved in the Oakland A's. And so we spent about 10 minutes talking baseball. And I said, can we just come out here and let's just talk about baseball? Uh, so I, I had a difficult relationship with my father. Uh, there was physical abuse when I was a kid. And uh, there were a number of times when uh, it was a real, real sad situation. But the only time that I really was with my father and he was present and I felt uh, real love and connection was when we sat in the right field bleachers at Yankee Stadium. And uh, his love of the Yankees and uh, my love of baseball grew out of that relationship. And um, my relationship with my father, unfortunately, was really kind of built on the fact that he just was very bitter about what happened when he came back from the war and his inability to find purpose, dignity of work, and he was just an unhappy person and at times took it out on me and, and uh, I had to live with that. Uh, but, the, but baseball was the way in which our relationship was elevated and that was the best of times. Yeah. Well, it, I, It, it's interesting because Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote a book about that same theme, about wait till next year, about how her relationship with her father was built on learning to score a baseball yeah. game. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, it's time to wrap up, but I'd like to wrap up by asking you to tell the story of your trip to Normandy and the insights that that yeah. gave you. Well, th thank you for that opportunity. Um, this past year, uh, my wife Sherry and I have traveled the country uh, to really experience American life that was different than our own. And we've been to West Virginia, we've been to Pennsylvania to try and understand the opioid crisis. Uh, we've been to the southern border. Uh, we've, seen, we've seen kids in internment camps. Um, we, we went to Gettysburg and I always wanted to go to Normandy. And so we, we took a trip to Europe and we went to Normandy. Could I just see a show of hands how many people have been to Normandy? Yeah. Uh, so you, you all know some of the things I'm going to say. And it's, it's, it's sacred ground. Uh, you, you walk Omaha Beach and you look up at those cliffs and you, you have, you're in awe of the valor and the bravery and the sacrifice of uh, American warriors. Um, and our allies doing everything they, they did to save the world. And then you walk through the American cemetery and there's 9,300 uh, headstones. Two things happened at Normandy that really moved me, it was so riveting. Uh, the first thing is, was the last thing. So we spent the entire day there and we're getting ready to leave and we're basically in our car in the parking lot and a car pulls up right next to us and they get out and I hear American voices. And uh, so I, I opened the car door, I just wanted to talk to him. And it was a young couple from Baltimore, Maryland. She was a nurse and he was a lawyer. And I simply asked a question. I said, what, what brought you to Normandy? Why are you here? And, and she did not miss a beat, not a beat. And she said, uh, we came to Normandy to be reminded of who we once were. Think about that. And it, I, f I felt like it was just a spear that went through me, that this young couple from Baltimore had to come to Normandy to be reminded of who we once were. It's heartbreaking. Yet, about 30 minutes before that, I had a very different experience. So thank you for allowing me to tell this story. Uh, so Sherry and I were walking in the cemetery, and, and um, we kind of split up, and I found myself about 50 yards away from her, and she was walking, and I was walking, but way in, in, in the distance, I saw 
a figure kneeling down in a uniform uh, that was the uniform of the people working in the cemetery. And I just kept walking towards him, and I finally got to about three yards right, th right in front of him. And um, he was on his knees in his uniform, a Frenchman who spoke no English with a scrub brush, a hand scrub brush. And his job uh, was cleaning and scrubbing to make, a, make every headstone as pristine as possible, as clean as possible. And he was hand scrubbing it. And I, I kneeled down and I, I just reached out and I just said, thank you for what you're doing. And I, I actually started crying. And uh, he stood up, and as I said, he didn't speak any English, and he said, thank you, America. Thank you, America. And uh, so these two experiences, which happened within 30 minutes of each other, where a Frenchman was thanking America, and a young couple from Baltimore had traveled to be reminded of who we once were, what's in the middle of that is I think the responsibility we have to recognize that we, we are in a fragile moment. And regardless of whether you agree with me or not about what I might or might not do, I know you all agree with me about one thing, and that's the love of our country and responsibility we all have to restore faith and confidence in the promise of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.